Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of The Podcast. I am this week's host, Mark Galley. I am here, still in my flat in Leith, and proving once and for all that we all live in Leith. <laughs> um, I am joined by a wonderful bunch of nutcases. Uh, we have Dr. Katie, shall I compare thee to a summer's day ales? Bex, <laughs> full many a glorious morning I have seen Sherwood, and Kevin, to me, fair friend, you can never be old, McLean. Um, welcome, guys. <laughs> I thought wow. you were going to be nice to like show me up for being mean to you in the first one, but no, 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 no. Right down to my petty level. You can never be old. To me, you will always be young. I thought that was very nice, or at least poetic, uh, poetically <laughs> sounding. Yeah. But yeah, welcome. Yeah. It's good to be here and be in, yeah, be in control, be in the driver's seat for a week. And hello to all of you. Thank you. If uh, you are new to the podcast, welcome. Uh, if you have been here before, welcome back. Um, we are, yeah, this, uh, we are a group of poets trying to do Napo Rimo. Uh, traditionally, Napo Rimo is where you write a poem every day in April. Uh, and we did that. So we finished it. So this year we're doing something a bit different where over sort of still over the month of April and with a, a little bit extra, we are doing uh, five forms. Mark lives in a terrible part of Leith where the internet doesn't reach. Old Leith, we call it. Uh, he, I think he was saying five uh, different uh, forms. Five different forms. The internet does not reach my part of Old Leith. No, thank you no. very much, Kevin. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Zoom. I know my internet connection may be unstable. Um, <laughs> yes, so we are tackling five forms rather than uh, uh, a poem every day. And those five forms have come from our Return to Form series. Uh, where we challenged uh, different poets to take uh, different, uh, the same idea to five different forms. Uh, if you want to see that series or any of the poets or any of the workshops of how to, they will be very useful for stuff that is coming up. Check the things that will flash up and say, watch these videos now. Um, so we have, uh, we began, we began laying the foundations with concrete poetry. We then dug deep into golden shovels, completely breaking apart the metaphor before we've even started. Um, uh, <laughs> Katie with her tiny golden shovel having a wee <laughs> dig there. Uh, it's great. Tiny it's a tiny, I'm saying that it is a tiny golden shovel because to me, it just looks like you have the fanciest teaspoon ever they are effectively teaspoons yeah thank, thank you they again sarah grant for for providing us with golden shovels yes please continue <laughs> um but yeah thank you very much to, to sarah grant thank you to everyone that has been writing along with us we've seen some tremendous stuff uh which we will be sharing some of uh as we go along um, don't forget, guys, before we go on, that one of the main things you can do to, to help us is give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon. If you're listening to this, give it a rate and review. All of these things uh, that really help us uh, spread more of the, wor uh, the word of spoken words, because I am good with words. Um, and <laughs> so we're going to go to people better at words than me. <laughs> Or people with better interconnect internet connections than him. <laughs> Gremlins so are coming down the line. I know it does it for it does it for a few seconds rather than a thing which is the most annoying. Which is good because we're about to jump away from me uh, to some people that have been writing along with us, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Mr. Uh, Kevin McLean to do some reading for uh, for us of the one this week. We have uh, because last time we were doing Golden Shovel, uh, we had a wonderful uh, one get shared to us from Becky Myers. Um, and so we're going to ask Kev to to give that a share for us just now, if you're up for that, Kev. Totally. Uh, yes. Yeah, so like, it's one of our favorite things. I know we say it, but like, I don't read a lot of poetry. I watch a lot of poetry. And then the people that are in poetry videos tend to be the people that majority do nights and stuff. And it's hard to actually see new faces and stuff. I I don't I don't know Becky. I'd never I'd never seen her perform before. I don't think. And um, and it's doubly interesting this one because she actually based her poem. It's a golden shovel that she did from some previous week. She's been following along with the I Am Loud prompts, which has been super cool to see. Um, and this she has done as a, a sort of golden shovel of another kind of contemporary poet. 
um, Carl Burkett. And so I've never seen Carl either. And I was like, it, it's interesting because most people tend to go for sort of older poets, right? There's that kind of like, uh, you know, you, you do something older school that's a, a bit distant from you. And I really like the idea of going like Beck's did. No, no, you know, a more contemporary version. Hey, so yeah, I will, I will read this uh, from Becky and I will try and, I'm so bad at reading from uh, the page. I will try my best, Becky. I apologize. Uh, it is called Wonder. They say if you want to find magic, it's outside your comfort zone, found around not knowing what to expect, when you have no idea who's on the far side of the door, but you're hell-bent on walking through anyway. Now, I don't want this to sound like I'm putting them down, but I feel qualified to inform you there's magic in skipping the tedious trek down your stairs for a whimsical glide down the banisters. Based on experience, all my most spellbinding dreams occur purely on nights when I'm snug and secure in my bed, while my head rests on one single pillow, my right leg left out of the covers at ease with the shadows. I know in the quiet, I hear wonder speaking my name. The bones of this home creak with growing pains, slipping me words to the wise and subliminal bursts of encouragement, walking with fresh inspiration to venture outside of the door. I cross thresholds by treading familiar floorboards. What a stunning piece. Yeah, like I said, I'm so bad at reading. Uh, it's it's like so good. Go and, go and check out uh, Becky's work. And she is like, I think on Insta at Becky.Myers, right? B-E-C-C-Y. So We uh, share most of the poems that get sent to us. We reshare on our stories. So you can always just check out there. And that's how you can find loads of really great poets. So you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so uh, stellar work, Becky. I hope I didn't butcher it too much. I, I really like some of the lines in there. Like this this uh, home creaks and stuff. I, I just love that like subtle personification and the the kind of the juxtaposition of the the very sort of slow moving repetitive words she uses for like right setting up that kind of mundanity and then these little bursts of whimsy and, and uh, little moments I was I was really impressed I really just want a banister now so that I can slide down the <laughs> banister in a whimsical fashion as she advocates there it's yeah what a beautiful poem thanks Becky mm -hmm. thank you very much Bex any any thoughts on Becky's poem or yeah, any of the other absolutely. poems that have been shared yeah, absolutely. Well, I just want to say with Becky's poem, one of the things that I really love doing in poetry is when you use things like she used wonder and has like personified it and made it a sort of extra character. I like doing that quite a lot, particularly with like negative emotions. I haven't really seen it done as much with like positive stuff. So I think that was a nice spin on a normal thing that might have a technical name, but if it doesn't, I'll make one. Personification is one of those things I love in poems and I go on about it a lot when I see it and I'm like, that's so cool. Like, I, And I never, ever use it. <laughs> and I'm so bad at like, it's speaking about things from that kind of abstract point of view. I think it's the one thing my poetry really lacks. So like when I see it so kind of subtly and deftly done in something like Becky's, it's irritating. Stop it, <laughs> Becky. <laughs> I was that's just thinking as well, uh, Bex, when you brought up sort of personifying negative emotions. We have an amazing poem on this channel by Hannah Lavery called Rage. Um, we'll link it in the description below, but it's um, that's another, you know, stunning example of a poet, yeah, personifying a negative emotion. Um, yeah, definitely something if you haven't experimented with that in your own work, guys, to, to try out, because yeah, the results can be surprising, so yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 personification, I love in a lot of stuff as well. For me, with it made me think of going back to the first episode of the new season of the Loudcast with Imogen Sterling and her like love the sinner where like that wonderful like love the sinner one of mine I always like is the you know like the idea of the four horsemen um which I've got a similar in, in one of my own poems as well these yeah personification that's very very interesting somehow making it more human you're like oh I can understand it better than the concept it's least. funny though because I think there is like I, I think not that it's it's a bad way to do it but I think those things sort of jump out right like uh like sin or um you know those like very ingrained almost pre-personified things right things we already like uh the four horsemen with war and pestilence and stuff that's it's it sort of uh 
it works with the current vocabulary, right? The, the verisimilitude uh, or whatever is is already there for us. But like newer personification is harder to do. Like Beck said, like the idea of wonder, I've never heard of wonder kind of personified and given that that form. And I think it's hard to push your brain to see those things to pick up. Like that's one of the things I always like about poetry when you see something so like clear and obvious that you go, oh, why have I not seen that before? And it, it's, it's yeah, uh, I think it's it's something to kind of step out of the, the consistent ones. Yeah, I know we have to move on from this because this is not the main thing, the theme of this episode. <laughs> um, but I really think as well that the, the things where that make it easier to personify these like negative qualities is part of the humanity of it all. Like we are all scared of war and illness and all of these things. And these are inherently human things. But wonder to everyone is such a subjective uh, moment that it's kind of more difficult to uh, place so yeah I think it's interesting anyway yeah, it has to be from a more personal <laughs> point of view yeah. mm -hmm. no absolutely and while you, uh, that you're saying Bex this video might not be the, the the main main focus let's say we are still here to be like to try and give writing tips and inspiration I know I got inspiration from a chat we had two weeks ago for something we've had so <laughs> I hope we are in inspiring uh or, you know, helping um, other people. And I'm going to remember a thing now before we move on to the main thing that I've forgotten to do up to now. If you do want to be inspired or check out more of the work that we've done, I mentioned previously that we did uh, Napa Rimo last year where we wrote a poem every day. But we also, we from that, took a selection of some of the poems we finished along with some of um, uh, some other people that had been writing alongside. Um, I'm going to get, oh, I'm going to get this, there was... Uh, Stuart Kenny, Fiona Liddell, Georgia Bartlett McNeil, Jack Hinks, Jack Hinks, of course, Stuart Kenny, and I think he was already mentioned. I think oh, sorry. Was it just <laughs> counts four? twice. He's Stuart. yes, and then us, also it, the us, the four of us, but us. also Perry, who and had Perry. not really written <laughs> much mm -hmm. poetry before, and his stuff is really, really great, which mm -hmm. is hugely irritating. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, if you're not a patron yet, you can go on, you can uh, get up there for, for as little as like a, a pound a month and stuff like that to to check out the things that are up there or or feel feel free to, to give us more. We're, we're a fan of food. I know I have I have longed for it on many a cold night. Um, but we move on to the main portion of this uh, podcast, which is where we are talking about sonnets. Sonnets! We are, yeah, we're getting on it with sonnets um oh. i know right oh on it with sonnets has been my my favorite thing um <laughs> so briefly before so my my uh so my son is, is is already out on our youtube coffee morning you can go check that out <laughs> i am sorry um but um, uh, uh, just before we go on we'll just for the people that might not be caught up this might be people as i say and this might be people's first in a podcast uh we're just gonna we're gonna run over what son is and i think when who better than than, than the, the good doctor herself to give us a very brief rundown of the core components. I know I nailed it last time, so cannot be uh, made better. So that's the thing. I don't think I can say it any better than you did last week, Mark. You you summed it up gloriously. But yeah, the the four components of a sonnet basically they're fourteen line long poems. They follow a set rhyme scheme where there's four uh, stanzas, so three stanzas that are four lines long each called quatrains, quatrains and then it ends with the final quatrains mm. and then it ends with the final couplet which is a two-line stanza um and they are written in iambic pentameter uh which is basically there's 10 syllables per line and they follow the rhythm unstressed stressed unstressed stressed repeated five times uh and then the last component is that there's a volta which is sort of a twist or a turn in the final couplet um some sort of change in meaning so basically while you're writing them you have to juggle these four components which is uh awful yeah pretty much but that's <laughs> what um that is the challenge that we have set ourselves and others this week I said, my, mine is is already out. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll we'll hear thoughts. But I want to I want to jump to you first, Bex, uh, on the subject of sonnets, um, because it's a nice link from Coffee Morning, which sounds very nice, but is less so. And so under the idea of dirty, uh, so in more. Let's let's not call them inappropriate, but yeah, I think you know what I mean with that sonnets. Uh, I want to go to I you. Would, yeah, I I would say that there are certain poems that I have that I would not perform 
at every gig. Um, and I think that's probably the nicest, the, the best way to put it. Uh, my my first part, I, I loved this week, by the way. I, mm-hmm. I know that not everyone enjoys sonnets. I had loads of different, I had just a really great week of writing. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. Um, and I have had previous experience writing a sonnet. My first ever poem was actually a sonnet. This was before I'd even come to Edinburgh, this is like this crazy uh, small world thing that happens. I went to I went to uni with Mark, which some people know, um, down in London. And a friend of mine who I lived with asked me, to, she was like, oh, I'm coming, I'm going to do spoken word for the first time. Can you come along to this poetry night? And I was like, ugh, poetry. Um, but she said, oh, you should like perform. And I'm a bit of an attention seeker. So I was like, okay. And I thought, well, I want to write a poem, I know, so, so shocking. Um, but I was like, I want to write something that is a, definitely a poem, but it's 100% funny. So what I was like, oh, well, what's more of a poem than like Shakespeare, Sonnet 18, whatever, um, which I think is the right one, Sonnet 18. Yeah, Sonnet 18 is like, shall I compare thee to a summer's day and whatever? Uh, and I just made it a bit rude and naughty uh, with what I made it be it's about sex. I just made it about sex. Um, and I came along because I was like, oh, I still like doing comedy. So I'm going to do this sonnet and there and blah, blah, blah. And uh, the host of that night was the repeat beat poet, PJ, uh, because he also went to our uni just as a really small world. And he was like, you should do more poetry. And I was like, yeah, man. And then I didn't for three years. <laughs> and now I'm here writing sonnets again. And it's come full circle. Absolutely maddening that your first poem was a sonnet. That's I wrote ju- and it's, parody it's songs. so good. <laughs> it's so good too. Sonnet sixty nine, the one that you're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, it's yeah. I might not make that one for YouTube, but if people want to hear it, I'll make it a Patreon exclusive. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, after after coffee morning, and let's just call them what they are: sexy poems. That's yeah. all we can call them now. Not like just you know, may, may, maybe the time for for sonnet sixty nine is is closer. Maybe it's what the people I remember. Need. I remember being backstage at a Loud Poets gig and Jim Monaghan, while you were performing, turned to me and went, I didn't realise aggressively sexual was a genre of poetry. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Jim, that's what he does. Don't worry about it. <laughs> remember that same gig he asked me afterwards. I've not really gigged with Jim much at that point. And he went, so, so is that, is that what you do? You just like threaten people in poetry? Because I just, <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's all I do, but... I'm, it, it, it's you know when you go i'm all right with i'm like i could be, i'm like you know all right like but then that's a bit you, i don't think you're getting booked for many gigs as the threatening poet <laughs> it's not a good vibe no oh. so, okay so okay so bet you've had a good time with it katie how did how's writing sonnets how's sonnet week been for you right so you know how when i lead workshops i'm like Hi everyone, welcome. We're gonna do iambic pentameter. This is lovely and stick with it. Happy writing. Yeah, um, I hate that person. She's <laughs> way too happy and optimistic because writing my sonnet this week took me ages and it was a nightmare. And I spent, I started writing it early. I was good. I did some writing every day. I worked on it consistently. And then it was sort of like 6 p.m. last night. And I'm just staring at this this shell of an unfinished sonnet and like screaming. Um, I don't like this form. Uh, it is not for me. I think it it is for others. It is good that it exists. Um, I resent it. Wow. So that strong. that was my week. I, that is really strong. <laughs> Damn. Uh, okay, so let's so less <laughs> less of a good time to uh, Kev. Are you going to give me some kind of middle ground, or you've got two camps here? So <laughs> you know, I was real concerned that I was like because I was all like, oh, I don't really like golden uh, concrete because I'm not good at art, and then I was like, oh, I don't really like the golden shovel because it's restrictive, and I was like, oh, I'm going to come on here and be the negative one about sonnets as well. But it looks like yeah, that's that's covered by game. <laughs> I gotcha. Uh, I gotcha. No, it was like it was an interesting one. I I I didn't find it like super hard. Like I managed to do it. I watched Kate's workshop and required extra input from Kate, like to like uh, uh, Kate how to do it. But um, yeah, I got there, and I, I I have a poem. It makes sense-ish and stuff. But it's it's not it's not something I would choose particularly to write in that form. I think I think it, it's nice doing these because it kind of like 
the next one you do makes you re-reflect on the one you did previously. And it made me really appreciate kind of Golden Shovel, which worked more as a guide, like a template. Like here's a, a point for an initial idea. And then here's a kind of rough guide of what you want to do, but then just put your own poem in. Whereas it's the meter. It's the specific thing of going like, no, 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 no. You can't go and end it on those three words you want. You need to find some other combination. And then how often it's like, oh, I could say that. Oh no, it, it, it's hard to add one syllable to a, a, a sentence, you know what I mean? And it was just, it, it really frustrated me. And I think whereas with Concrete and Golden Shovel, I came away with what I think is the best version of those poems. I like, I, you know, I mean, I was like, that's how that should be. That's cool. It's been, it's been made more interesting by the form. Whereas what I got from Sonnet, I think, is a good um, template for a better poem. That's exactly how mm. I feel as well. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, I was in, I I sat uh, bet you're on your own here. I also hated writing a sonnet. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, I really I was very excited about what I wanted to write about. I was very excited about you know the topics and and how I was going to write it. But then yeah, the meter was the main part of of the restrictions that really. <laughs> That, that really hard say it's hard to add us like you know a syllable or you know if there's because then the, the rhyme scheme kind of like helps and throws a few like stabs in the back while you're not looking because you're like yes cool got my rhyme scheme you're like okay you can add, you can't add a word after you can't really add some before if you then have to like change the sentence you're like going in other poems you can maybe change that end word and as long as it still works within the confines you'd be all right but then you change everything i was like yeah like one little thing has big snowball effects with this one yeah that was i'm not an editor like i know we've discussed before that we lean into like free form and specific performance focus because i would rather worry about the tempo of my cadence and the the like beat of where the jokes are or where the sort of like turn is or where you know what i mean like the the performance minded things we think of and having to be like oh no you can't you can't a really good example is halfway through mine, I went into something I do, I, I didn't really think about it, I do in most of my poems. I picked up the pace and went from a kind of a couplet rhyming structure into a like internal rhyme structure where it was going, you know, much more compound rhyming. And then I went, oh no, I can't, I can't do that at all because it just, <laughs> I can't go yeah. there. And then I had to edit it, which I never do. I never edit. I, I edit in time and then have a finished piece and I had to edit it. And I was like, oh, well then, because I'm changing that one word, I have to throw out four <laughs> lines and the changes. And then I don't know what to say instead. And Kate was like, yeah, well, have fun. See you in a bit. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> it just, you know what I mean? It, it's really frustrating. Okay, but Bex, you obviously had like at least a more fun time, if maybe not an e an easier time. So no, let's, I let's... think I had a really easy time compared to. Oh, else. okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, like I I grew up around music and rhythm and stuff like that. So and and like to me uh, inherently, there's always something very pleasing about like da -da 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 like just that like rhythm and tempo and beat and whatever in uh, writing. And what I would do is that I figured out quite early on that the first line of Pokemon, I want to be the very best is like eight, like is eight rather than the 10. I want to be the very best or whatever. Um, so that like helped me bring like I could then use that like tune that I knew to like write a framework of like some initial middle bits and it made me find like interesting words that were like had you know that just naturally I think unquestionable I found and I was like oh that's a great word for a sonnet because it has all these like meters in the right place and it sounds right and unquestionable da, 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 da. too and many syllables to think write. about with that word banks too many syllables it's one word not, yeah. monosyllabic and that's that's the way to be yeah, I don't know. I just start. I stopped looking at it so much as everything in context and started. I don't know. Things just mm. fell into place for me, which was really nice um, because it did not happen for Golden Shovel Week. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to to share mine a little bit more if people would like. Yeah, to hear I, it. I mean, yes. I mean, I think it's about time we gave the people what they want some some more poetry. So yeah. <laughs> let's 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 start off on the yeah on the strong note. If they remember one sonnet before we start just destroying them. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I started watching Katie's workshop. Obviously, when you have to write a poem, you go and see if Katie has made a workshop to help you. It's really annoying when I return to free form and I'm not going to have any guidelines. <laughs> um, so you just record a one minute video going, do what you want. Happy <laughs> writing. <laughs> we should release an April Fool's free form workshop. And it is that. It's just do as you please. <laughs> That would be great. I think we should make a note. Um, but yeah, anyway, she like I think quite early on, uh, she was like, okay, you need to do a mind map and think about things that change. And I was like, well, no one changes their mind more than Henry VIII, uh, obviously. That <laughs> why wouldn't your brain go there? Um, and I, as growing up in English schools, all you learn about is like the good bits. So it's like, but not even the good bits, just like you learn about kings. That's it. You like, I know a lot about the Tudors and Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and all of that stuff. Like I know that bit of England um, fairly well. And I've always been really annoyed that the women who were married to Henry VIII have been given such like negative, you know what I mean? They're nothing. No one, they're like, you know what I mean? Barely anyone would even be able to like say what their names are. And there's only three, like there's four names between six of them. Um, so it's like, there's two Anne's, three Catherine's and a Jane. You know what I mean? It's not that difficult to like remember. Um, but I started thinking about, you know, Henry VIII. And I was like, I think this works really well for a sonnet because sonnets were, you know, Shakespearean sonnets were just after that kind of era. But in Shakespeare's time, you would not write something that was about the royal family because that's very like, you know, bad. You'll get told off and all of that. Um, Dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to read my sonnet. Uh, I've called it Anne uh, and it's about Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. So I hope you enjoy. At matrimony's end our tale begins, and though I stood with grace and poise polite, I awaited judgment from the king, with me he took particular delight. Together we would have a happy life, I promised to deliver him an heir, but first he had to get rid of his wife. She took the news with anger and despair. For seven years we toiled to see this done, and through the years our love was turned to hate. I could not keep my promise of a son, without one I now meet a darker fate. There are no people in such poisoned hands than dwellers of those green and pleasant lands. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> oh, it's Very so nice. good. Oh, so so yeah, not sexual. Oh. I apologize. Um, no, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm disappointed, but I'm I'm sure other people are are, are relieved. Um, no, what a great piece! I love the. I like that. That's your starting point. Is when you went, you went because you went because I, I did a similar thing when you go right. Well, you need a twist. So you're like, well, what am I changing from what to what? And I like yeah. that you went. Who changes their mind more than Henry VIII? That it wasn't a, that you did. It wasn't a, like a twist or a shift. You were like, it was just a change of mind rather than it's anything lit, else, yeah. which is. So it like was that, literally just that was I could write a sonnet about all of them because he fucked over every single one should. of his wives. <laughs> all do all six. There's a musical about all six of them, right? Which is eight. That's, oh yeah, it's great. Like it's great. um yeah, like I I think oh no, go ahead, Kev. No, yeah. no, no, it's fine, you go. I, I think um yeah, because even though yeah, the starting point was that sort of change, you do still have that great Volta where um, you know there are no people in such poisoned hands as I'm, I'm not quoting it exactly, but because um, the green lands is sort of this like shorthand for England, right? Like yeah, green and pleasant, green pleasant. lands is like yeah. Jerusalem is is a hymn that uh, is fairly well known and it's very like synonymous with England and uh, it calls England's green and pleasant lands. And I think that works so well the way that you sort of use that common phrase, um, but the inherent twist is is the irony in there, and mm -hmm. you know the poisoned hands of the monarchy. Um, oh, I wrote just, the twist yeah. first, and then wrote the rest of the poem. <laughs> I did the same. Like I, I think that that's such a good way of doing it, knowing where you're ending up, so that you can work to that. I normally hate doing that in poetry, but I think when you're writing in form, that can be such mm. a useful device. Yeah, stunning yeah. piece. The thing I did find hard about this though was trying to concisely, because that's their entire relationship. I summarized in like fourteen lines, and then that's with rhyme and stuff like that. So that was really difficult. Is like working out what things were like. You know, because there's loads of, obviously, when you do history and there's like a story, it's like, you know, they were there for seven years. There was loads of stuff before he, you know, got his, he got Anne's sister pregnant. There's all sorts of weird English incest drama in Tudor court. You can't fit all that in in 12 lines and a volta. Welcome to Katie's Helen of Troy dilemma, Bex. <laughs> yes. Oh my well. gosh. 
can get rid we of that. We have to mention oh. her in every episode. Every it's episode. a rule. Yeah, that's... Um, um, that's what I was going to say, the though. podcast bingo. <laughs> it's what I was going to say, though, is is that's what I really liked about it because I it's what I struggled with. And I often give... <laughs> this is probably it's just I am loud bingo because I say it all the time. My kind of blanket definition for poetry is saying a big thing in its simplest and most beautiful way, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean short, right? But like, sim- like simple, like so people can you know, t- condensing it in and I, I i say that but i do find it very difficult to do <laughs> uh, people that regularly watch our stuff will know that brevity is not my strength <laughs> so i find it really interesting that in 14 lines it felt longer and i don't mean that in a bad way i just mean it felt dense it felt like there was a lot of information in there but it never and it is the benefit of the sonnet because it, it gives you the flow so that that you you have to I guess force that those changes right you have to make it more brief you have to find mm-hmm. a way to be more concise and and sort of direct in what you're saying but uh, it's a much better example of because I I wrote and wrote and wrote and then realized I had like two lines to just be like oh no I've run out of time whereas that <laughs> felt much more balanced. I did structure it as I went along. I did like have a look at the narrative of their relationship and obviously ending with a sh- spoiler alert for those who haven't <laughs> don't know about Henry history. VIII um, is that obviously at the end you know he left his wife he reformed the church he there was these huge changes that were made and it took seven eight years for them to get together and then within a couple of years she hadn't given him a son he'd had a horrible accident that left him forever a paranoid horrendous wreck of a human being uh and then he just started murdering people including her even though there was like genuine love yeah it's confusing but we anyway. we have been the podcast uh are apparently very much not fans of the monarchy the uh, people's <laughs> republican podcast you mean <laughs> oh no oh god i'm scared no i'm scared to give i'm scared to give kev the the floor after that katie let's go to let's go <laughs> let's go to let's go to your one next so talk us to thank you very much for sharing that back so say any any sort of bits any one for like not forgot to say or came up afterwards i just i just really good. loved that yeah again like what a great way of thank you um putting it together but let's, let's go from the easiest time to the straight up scorn of shakespearean sonnets Kate, i like it Okay, the, the floor is yours. T- talk us through your sonnet and then... I mean, interestingly, that was a great transition from Bex's to mine because uh, mine is not necessarily all that much less uh, critical of power systems. But yeah, that that's all that I'll say on that. Um, yeah, I, I struggled with this. And interestingly, the bit that I thought that I would find the hardest was the meter, but that was the bit that I found the easiest in the end, which I really did not expect. Um, The way that I tend to write, and I think I've spoken about this a little bit before, is I just draft bajillions of pages of stuff. And then once I have a lot of stuff out there, I sort of, I pan for gold effectively. I look for the bits that I find most poignant, most interesting, most sort of distilled, as Kev is saying, you know, poetry as a distillation of of sort of beautiful moments and concise in that way. So what I did for the sonnet was I did my usual process, but I did it in iambic pentameter. So I just wrote as many phrases and lines as I could think of about my topic in iambic. And that wasn't the hard bit. I sort of got the, the meter in my head and that was fine. But then I ended up with like seven pages of stuff in iambic pentameter and I had to look at the structure of the sonnet and go, crap, how do I fit this sort of idea, this narrative that I want to convey into 14 lines and into the rhyme scheme and incorporate the Volta? And then that was the nightmare for me. Um, So I do, you know, I have a poem to share today. It is (laughs) a sonnet. Um, and I'm, I'm not totally down on it. I'm, I'm proud, with, uh, proud of what I came up with, but I think I would have loved to do it in, you know, rather than 14 lines and 28 lines or something. I, I think that I picked a concept that would have been better served with a slightly longer piece. So that's, that's sort of where I am with my sonnet. Okay. okay. Shall I? Yeah, yes, yes. If, if you wouldn't mind. Share thee to a summer's day. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. All right. Yeah, I won't say anything on the on the topic. I'll just go into it. 
Captain America gets chemo. It works just like the serum in reverse, a poison that will weaken, not enhance. Enfeebling this symbol feels perverse, but we must cure you while there's still a chance. We must prevent these strengthening, hateful cells, which multiply, harass all in their way, irradiate the bones in which they dwell, the skeleton that festers worse each day. The treatment's painful, changes always are. You'll lose that perfect crew cut, have your weight, but evolution's preferable by far than the supremacy that would await. With luck, you'll heal, return to prove your worth, unless the cancer's been there from your birth. So that's my poem. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So, it's interesting because I, I know you and I, I know you no, it's interesting uh, I know you do uh, bingo. Uh, I know you do <laughs> <laughs> like write political stuff but it's often from a more personal lens right like I know even your your poems like um the one about Hiroshima and stuff is is you, you kind of inhabit the the position of the the pilot right and, and kind of try and look at it in a more personal lens it's interesting to see you do something more overtly critical and detached from yourself you know i mean mm. it's not it's not your when you get political it's often about the impact of political choices on you or on yeah. or, or, or on a character or whatever whereas this is much more you know an allegory or or extended metaphor which is interesting to see i think it's different from what you do more often yeah, yeah I, I tried to flip it there. Yeah. And um, take the I voice out of it, you know, and, and just make it about this, this metaphorical symbol. Yeah. The hugely diverse range of language as well, Kate, is one thing that I'm always so impressed by in your work. Your vocabulary is 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 so extensive, but it's, it's really selective. Like there are words in there that are, you know, it's not vocabulary for vocab vocabulary sake or forced rhyming they're very mm. like selected words it's it's just a it's an annoying thing because i <laughs> probably <laughs> i probably uh found my sonnet easier than you found yours but i think it's testament to that if you're finding something difficult but still making progress it probably means that that progress is substantial like mm. you know it being hard is often a testament to the the quality of the, the final product and as much as you say it should be a longer poem. I don't know if I wholeheartedly agree because I think mm. there is something very um, nice there about it being condensed. Unlike Bexy's where it's trying to fill it, a, a big story into a little space, which Bex does really well, <laughs> you're taking more of a conceptual approach than a narrative approach, which I think does fit the sonnet more. Mm. Yeah, I, I also think this is like one of the poems that perfectly demonstrates what we as a collective often talk about, which is in terms of bringing form into pieces of spoken word. Because to me, when you're reading through that, that doesn't appear as a sonnet. It's not like mine is fairly obviously a sonnet. Like that is what it, it's like, sonnet to son, son, sonnet, right? Uh, but like yours as a, you know, you can feel the meter and that rhythm and the da 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 all the way through it. And there's that rhyme, but because of the way that you've kind of structured the piece, it's not so like official, you know, when you're reading it, it's not so like, this is a line break, this is a line break, that's the mm. end of the first stanza, here is the next stanza. It's much more like fluid. It goes, it goes to what you were saying, Bex, about, because it was interesting, I thought when you said about the, the because you were singing it, like, a, like rhythmically, mm -hmm. and the thing I found most difficult about the meter is Kate would go, no, no, because hear it, okay, da, 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 and I go, but I can fit anything into that, because um, I can, you know what I mean, I've, I've, I've always, that's been my point, is going, take the words and throw them into the rhythm or whatever you want and change inflection and tonality and pace and everything to facilitate the flow whereas what you did bex is 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 go oh no i'm going to use the flow they've given which i i'm not yeah. capable of but it's <laughs> yeah it, it shows the difference of readings mm. mm -hmm. yeah it, yeah 
Oh, okay. Were you going to f- feel like you were picking up for a point there? or No, it, it is just interesting. And I'm glad that it felt like it had flow because I, I was concerned about sort of the meter. Uh, it's so interesting when you read a sonnet aloud, right? Because you can either try to obscure the fact that it's a sonnet and like read it with your own flow or you can really read it da 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 um and so i yeah i i'm glad that it still came across as as fluid in that way um cool this is that's the difference i don't think i could read it like a sonnet i'm so bad at doing the because it was a piece of advice kate gave me which she said uh well callum o'dwyer you know because he did our our sonnet for his for return to form and and he, he gave a really good piece of advice was just read it you know as you're writing it like a sonnet and I was going well that's very good from Callum who's done Shakespeare in that <laughs> I'm sure that's that's excellent not super helpful for people that have it just read it like a Shakespearean sonnet <gasps> thanks right yeah no worries <laughs> yeah the the flow was one of the things with that we're trying to get it to flow coming from that more spoken word is wanting to have it have that sort of little or flow and like lines that I've written to the thing whereas then yeah I go I sort of did the opposite where I was writing a bunch of things and then going can that fit and trying to like mm. okay moving it like try to shift it left and right by one syllable depending mm-hmm. on what what like a weird game of Tetris I think that's where I like where what I didn't want to be play I wanted to play to like the the stresses of the words but I never wanted to play to like the rhythm that that was then setting out mm. um which obviously you, you don't have to do. And one of the things I like about the variety of, of, of poems that we got, you go and go, oh, that's a sonnet, but it's not a sonnet as people would, you know, like as you would have thought about it from school. It's not sonnet 18. It's, you know, with the likes of Bex's. And then you like with Katie's, um, you know, it's, you're not getting sonnets about Captain America in the old days. Obviously, you know, <laughs> 200 years, that might, be, you know, like that might be all oh, where we're not getting poems about Captain America in these days of mega Godzilla. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's the thing that you, you it was written for the time. And I have that following that, just this, this very strong image of even without all of it there, of this like, yeah, this crumbling strong figure, it leaves a very powerful lasting impression. So it's- mm. um, What was the, the thought on that, Kate? Cause again, just, I, I mean, it's obviously privy because I'm privy to a lot of your work. So I have a base understanding, but I don't think you've really ever, you, you don't spend a lot of time discussing pop culture characters. You know what I mean? Or or yeah. any sort of named characters. You tend to do things like Bobby Gibbs or, you know, you know historical figures, Helena Troy, <laughs> or, you know, I mean, people that, that you, you you are real um, or people from your own personal life who are also real. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, My mum's a ghost. <laughs> yeah, why, why lean into, is it just because we've been watching Marvel? So a lot of it genuinely, I, I was thinking about it and I, I've been increasingly drawn lately to writing about other people. And I think it in part sort of follows that track of, I spent so much time when I was sort of getting started writing, writing about myself, because that's where so many people start is with the confessional and with what they know. Um, Still I'm not there. saying No, but like, I, I don't think you ever exhaust it. And I don't think you ever should exhaust it because who you are changes throughout your life and and the poem of who you are will constantly evolve. But I think for where I am right now, I'm I'm trying to sort of go out with my personal experience and talk about other people. But then that also involves doing research. And I was like, oh, right, I've got to write this sonnet and that's going to be a bloody nightmare. And I don't have that much time to do research. We at, in our flat have been rewatching the entire uh, MCU, the entire Marvel universe, and also watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So I've been like really uh, absorbing a lot of this really contemporary mythology. Um, and thinking a lot um, about if if you don't know Falcon, look and the at Winter the PhD Soldier, trying to turn her comic book movies into contemporary mythology. myths. But, uh, drinking beer and watching superheroes <laughs> punch up cities, guys. That's what we're really doing here. Uh, but it, it has been great, and and a lot of what Falcon and the Winter Soldier is interrogating is um, what does this symbol mean? What does this shield mean? You know, who is Captain America, and what does that mean today? And As I've been watching that, I've also been listening to the news and listening to what's going on in Minnesota right now with uh, the shootings of more unarmed black men and the trial um, of Derek Chauvin. 147 mass shootings this year in the States. And it's been horrific. And so I've been thinking about, okay, um, 
what <laughs> big question, right? But what is America and what is America's legacy? And and this is something that I, I write a lot about, right? Particularly from my perspective as an expat now living away from the States. So all of that was sort of muddling in my brain. And, and so I was thinking about, okay, if I allegorize Captain America, what would be a metaphor to use to talk about um, this sort of cancer ultimately within the US? And so I was thinking, okay, Cap gets chemo what would that look like? And then that final Volta at the end meant to go, okay, we can heal you. We can cure this nation unless that cancer has been there from the start, right? Unless America is a nation that is predicated on, built upon literally the backs of slaves, unless um, racism is in the very DNA of this nation. And if that is the case, which it is. Or at least the white people that live there. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, how do we how do we heal? How do we cure? And how do we move on? And obviously, that's that's sort of the big question. So trying to get at that through this form and and yeah, to be brief and loop it back to, to what we were talking about before. I think that's the main thing that I struggled with was I have 14 lines to get across. It's Captain America. It's chemo. It's an extended metaphor for racism and bigotry in America. And I have to do like, how do I do all that? Um, then so a that good a good thing you challenge. told me when we were doing Golden Shovel was your poem doesn't need to tell the whole story. Yeah. Your poem isn't you know your poem isn't your entire thoughts on a subject or your mm-hmm. entire opinion maybe not even barely reflective of your opinion you know what i mean it can be a snapshot it can be a single piece so yeah yeah kev putting down an uno reverse card for kev's own advice well <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna come back to bite him now because kev we have we've come to you thank um so a lot of a lot of thought provoking stuff leaving off on, on katie's there but i'm i'm aware of time and we definitely want to make sure we get your poetry uh on here I'm, assu- I'm, I'm, I'm making no assumptions because every time I've made an assumption about what someone's going to write, they've surprised me. So t- tell us about your, your sonnet story. Yeah, again, it's like I struggle when I don't have something. Golden Shovel was the easiest week conceptually because I was already annoyed about something. And that's a yeah. good starting point for creative output, right? And then... Um, in a less negative way, Concrete Week was was good because I had I had just been thinking so much about Lasco Cave, uh, and 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 it was so present in my mind that it was an easy image to conjure. But um, I think with this, it was really hard to think of something initially. I'm, I just could not get out of seasons, love changes, and I was just like, oh, these are terrible, terrible just suggestions. <laughs> I was like, uh, I didn't want to write anything about lockdown. I didn't want to write anything about my body or anything like that. I was just like, ah, oh, this is all. Everything I thought about made me kind of sad that I was thinking about changes. I couldn't find sort of positive changes. <clears throat> and then, uh, I, as always, I, I then went, well, maybe I'll just write about a wrestler. <laughs> right? You know, because I was like, I, I, it's a thing I love. I'm always positive about that. I can find positivity. And so initially I thought, well, I'll write it about Sting because who's changed more than Sting, right? If, for those not listening. And not this is relevant singer. to poetry. Everyone else got to give their explanation. So this is a poem explanation. Okay, fine. Sting is a wrestler who started out in the 80s. And when he started out, he was like surfer Sting. He had a blonde crew cut and colorful makeup and you know, colorful tights. He was the bold baby face. And over the years into the nineties, he basically took the crow gimmick from the movie, the crow. And he went black and white face paint. And he hung out in the rafters and he wouldn't speak. And he was like, just completely transformed his character. And it was, it, it, it was one of the biggest, it made him one of the biggest stars in wrestling. And he's recently come back to wrestling with uh, all elite and stuff. And so I was just, maybe I'll write about him. And then I went, Ah, oh, just so specific and <laughs> specificity <laughs> hurts because then I was like, well, how many words rhyme with sting or icon or, you know what I mean? That was, ah, oh, it doesn't really work. <clears throat> so I decided to go more general and look at wrestling in, in its totality, which obviously has changed a lot, even in the time I've been watching, but since its inception, you know, a hundred years ago or whatever is, is changed substantially. And one of the key elements that's changed within it is kayfabe. And so kayfabe is the idea that unlike almost any other art form I know of, maybe other than spoken word, there is supposed to be a a separation between performer or artist and product, right? Character. 
So, but that doesn't exist in spoken word where we're kind of expected to be authentic and it doesn't exist in wrestling where you don't get credits at the end of the TV show. You don't get, you know, you are your character all of the time on your Twitter, on your whatever. And it was the same in the old days where heels and faces, good guys, bad guys wouldn't travel together. They wouldn't be seen together in, in towns, even though they had friendships and things like that. It gets into why even to this day, people will cut themselves for, for wrestling and physically bleed in a way you would never expect a stuntman or, or actor to do um, and things like that. And I think a lot has changed in the business when kayfabe kind of stopped being so much of a thing where people now know it's fake. And I think there's this idea that it's made lesser because it's fake. And I disagree because I think the health of performers is so much better now <laughs> than it ever was. Um, and I think that's a positive change. So that's kind of what the, the poem's about. Um, it's called kayfabe. This dance, a beautiful and bloody waltz, each careful step seen as a senseless strike, but the rage on display is mostly false, meant to convince you this dance is a fight. The length stars would stretch to maintain kayfabe would seem insane in this our new age, but what is small sacrifice compared to fame? When body is a wound, why fear a cup? No credits, edits, no scripts, no stuntmen, long miles and matches with no chance for rest. Just start to bump and feed again, again. You must make sure that you're up to the test. But I, for one, prefer my violence fake. Lose no good brothers to this darkest fate. Very nice, okay. very nice. Um, yeah, I I love that. One is an idea of going through, um, of going into kayfabe and that thing that is very important, uh, very important, obviously for for safety reasons and for the for the enjoyment reasons. But I love that. So I always love when you when you've got something that you are passionate about because we're like like I, it sounds very thingy, but you get maybe it's just because we've been like we've all been working together for quite a long time. But you can kind of like can kind of tell when you're like ah they don't care so much about the thing but with wrestling and pat like i mean there we go like you like there's a there's an element of when you're talking about something that, that you enjoy that's the royal you i think rather than not just you specifically um but it always makes me enjoy it a lot more because i'm like yeah he's happy he likes this thing or oh he's angry i should be angry there's like a, there's a <laughs> an energy that comes that comes from you and your pieces kev so oh, bex it's sweet, funny sweet. Oh, so okay. If you had a thing to say, jump on in. No, I was just gonna say it's funny because um, obviously, I we were sort of um, working a bit on this yesterday, where you were sort of asking guidance and things. Um, and I remember in the final line, um, because as you were saying earlier, the poem went through a lot of edits, um, which is sort of unusual for your process. Often you you know edit as you go, and it's sort of you know stable. But because of having to fit the meter in the rhyme scheme, it it changed a lot. I remember working on that final line, um, which has the phrase good brother in it. And I was like, oh, well, you could just like change this to match the meter and like take away good. And you were like, no, it has to be good brother because that's a phrase in the industry. And it's similar to what Bex did actually with the pleasant green lands um, using sort of a, a phrase which people will know using that hook within your poem but then the additional challenge being making it fit the meter in that way so it's interesting that yeah you both use that strategy on those like specific word choices and stuff uh, in you know recent years of writing and stuff I've tried to not gender my poems unless specifically necessary for you know a narrative purpose or like a, a, a specific character or if it's me right like um but I try and not just use he or men or whatever and you know as replacement for they or people or whatever and that's one of the things that kind of annoyed me about sonnet was for example stuntmen is not the term I would have used but men is one syllable and people is you know more yeah. so it's like I, I it couldn't fit and like good brother is different because you would call women in the industry good brothers they're still like you know I mean it's it's not a gendered term it comes from when it was predominantly men but like you know women in the industry are good brothers um so it was but it's it's those things where it makes a restriction or a change to what you would choose to do and i found that slightly annoying and then because i would want to go by the way i'm not specifically meant you know and it gets into the whole thing of explaining yeah. your poem rather than writing it the way you wanted it mm. 
Uh, I can great. definitely see why you would want like to have done this in a different format because you love wrestling so much, but also because you take care of like your poems to such a level that you want them when you're when they are finished that is because they are finished and you've done what it is so I could see like obviously I can see your kind of desire there to break out from the sonnet form but actually it was like just a really a nice piece like to encompass it as a whole and while and the same thing for Katie is that you know often you can feel like oh maybe if I just had an extra stanza I'll be able to get more in but sometimes by leaving it with less details for particularly for someone like me who doesn't really know anything about wrestling kind of leaves me to draw my own conclusions and understanding without having to have everything to like so this means this and this is that and whatever um, and kind of you know it's still I still know what you're talking about I'm still like aware of the piece without having to know you know the terms like good brothers and stuff like that that are related to wrestling specifically so yeah I, I think as well, I have fallen into a trap a lot in my poetry of I never wanted to cons I never wanted to write about the same things when I started out. So when you look at my early poems, right, there's it's easy to go, oh, they're love poems and stuff, but they're all kind of very different angled. And quite quickly, I moved away from that and started writing just very <laughs> wide array of topics. And I think I've always somehow got that stuck in my head. And it's it's I want to say everything I want to say about wrestling in one poem and you go well a 14 line poem probably not the place to represent over 20 years of fandom for a thing <laughs> um, and it's it's trying to convince myself I'm allowed to repeat on subjects and there are poets I love who not only speak about similar subject matter but <laughs> cows <laughs> but, but you know someone like Andrea Gibson who I've, I don't think I've ever heard Andrea do a poem that doesn't include the word moon <laughs> it's, you know what I mean <laughs> regardless of topic theme or whatever because it's 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 the central metaphor that they, they use so wonderfully and and so flexibly and and things and I think I need to be I need to allow myself to repeat more because mm. it's you know you can put out a whole Don Patterson release a book of sonnets or a Beck Sherwood a pamphlet about cows or whatever you are allowed to change your opinion and say something new or, or or say something in an expansion of something previous and so like I was because previously I would have just not used wrestling because I would have been this is not what I want to say in its entirety and I would have done something else whereas now I'm going this is maybe a good template for a slightly more expanded poem that I do in a free form thing and finally actually get off my butt to write the wrestling poem I've been milling over in my head for years. Well, we're not we're not going to give you free form, but I am interested to see whether <laughs> next week, um, because Sam, I would love to, to sit and debate, uh, chat about the poems, of, um, but we are we are pressed for time. And next week we are going on to Sestina. So, I mean, maybe you can re can repeat with Sestina. Um, that would be an interesting idea, actually. Sestina. Wrestling Sestina. To maybe try and take the core thing of the sonnet and and flesh it out with a bit, you're having a bit more room in the Sestina. I might play with that. Well, for, for while, while you're having a mull over, Katie, I'm going to put back to you as the leader of the workshops. If you can give it, it's very hard to describe these forms, obviously, in, in a couple of sentences. I, I highly encourage anyone for, you know, for extended help to check out Katie's workshops on the forms that you're wanting to do. But just for those that are sort of listening along, if you can give them a, a base idea, roughly. Uh, I know with Sestina, it is hard, though, so do, do your best. <laughs> yeah, so basically, a Sestina... Um, it's an old French form and it's sort of evolved over time. And the way that we do it now is it's 39 lines long. Uh, so it is longer when we think about the, the sonnet as 14 lines, much longer, right? Um, it is six um, stanzas of six lines each and then a three line stanza at the end, which is called the Envoy in the Sestina form. Basically, the whole concept of the Sestina revolves around using six words as the end words um, to every single line of poetry in your Sestina and repeating those six words. So you, you pick six words sort of at the outset of writing, and then each of those words will be used seven times throughout your Sestina. Uh, so the real challenge of the form is basically A, choosing your words and B, figuring out how to use those words in interesting and varied ways, repeated a bunch throughout your poem. Uh, it's hard, um, 
but it's when when you get a, a well written Sestina, it's incredibly worthwhile. There are some stunning pieces. There's out no there. restriction to the length of lines or meter of the line, though, right? So I have deliberately made it a bit easier. Traditionally, in 13th century France and all that, they were written in iambic pentameter. I have said, don't bother, uh, Ooh, because contemporary no. Sestina is generally some people do adhere to that form i'm, I'm gonna saying, edit this no. whole explanation out of this bit in the yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah, there, it's that no no so it's just no restrictions on meter or form no restrictions on no meter. restrictions on meter no, no. restrictions on meter or also. line length no okay you, you do you all right uh bex how how you feeling about sestina you've been very confident with, with sonnet yeah um i Mm, 39 lines is a, is a very long poem <laughs> for me I tend to favor short poems a lot of my poems do not get to like the only reason it would be 39 lines long is if I needed 30 line 39 lines to fit 50 puns in right so like <laughs> I've never but normally I like to stick to like an A4 page that's like the length that I will go but this is longer and it has like repeated themes and stuff like that and that that's not really my whole bag so i might try something very different from like anything i've written before or it might be about cows who knows cool well to give that's so kate gave us a great ex uh, explanation there are the workshops that you can uh, go and check out but uh, as a tradition i'm gonna i'm gonna round us off on this uh, episode of then a podcast with a uh, a sestina by by an, uh, by a writer that uh, i'm a big fan of seamus heaney um I was very, I didn't know that, he, that they had a Sestina beforehand and that's absolutely on me, but I was very happy to discover that, uh, <laughs> that they did. Um, so I apologize for my reading of it. This is uh, one of the first, or one of the first few times I've read it. Um, but this is uh, Two Lorries by Seamus Heaney. It's raining on black coal and warm wet ashes. There are tire marks in the yard. Agnew's old lorry has all its cribs down, and Agnew the Coleman, with his Belfast accent, sweet-talking my mother. Would she ever go to a film in Magherafeld? But it's raining, and he still has half the load to deliver further on. This time, the load our coal came from was silk black, so the ashes will be the silkiest white that Magherafeld, via Tunbridge, bus goes by. The half-striped lorry with its emptied folded coal bags moves my mother, the tasty ways of a leather aproned coal man. And, fil uh, and, and films no less, the conceit of a coalman. She goes back in and gets out the black lead and emery pepper. This 1940s mother, all business round her stove, half wiping ashes with a black with a backhand from her cheek as the bolted lorry gets revved and turned and heads for Mag Herrefeld. And the last delivery, oh Mag Herrefeld, oh dream and red plush and a city coalman, as time fast forwards and a different lorry groans into shop. Up Broad Street with a payload that will blow the bus station to dust and ashes. After that happened, I had a vision of my mother a revenant on a beach where I would meet her in that cold floored waiting room in Mag Herrefeld. her shopping bags full up with shoveled ashes. Death walked out past her like a dusk faced Coleman, refolding body bags, plying his load, empty upon empty in a flurry of moats and engine revs. But which lorry was it now? Young Agnews or that other heavier, deadlier one set to explode in a time beyond her time in Magherafelt. So tally bags and sweet talk darkness, Coleman listen to the rain split in new ashes. As you heft a load of dust that was Magherafelt, then reappear from your lorry as my mother's dreamboat Coleman filmed in silk white ashes. Yeah, I apologize for the reading there. That was a bit stunted in, in, in bits and a, a heavier subject matter, to be fair. Uh, but of that that of that re repeating and use of lines and shows, you can kind of go a bit anywhere with uh, the Sestina. 
I mean, it's, you shouldn't have read Heaney. That's made me really self-conscious now for doing <laughs> so, I see. Uh, that's uh, brutal. Got, well, I mean, last time it was Sonnet, it was Sonnet Boom, and that blew us out of the water with Tony Walsh's yeah, one. So true. I think oh, good to end on a strong true. note. Um, and on that note, uh, so this has been the no podcast, the Sonnet edition. Uh, I have been the host, Mark Galley, with Dr. Katie Ailes, Beck Sherwood, and Kevin McLean. Um, please remember to yeah, like, comment, subscribe, do all that rate and review, all those wonderful things, guys. Keep writing along, keep sharing with us. We look forward to hearing more and more of your stuff. And yeah, we will be back next week with Sustinas. For now, everybody. Oh, no. Yeah, Sustinas. Everybody, yeah. say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.